Up today, we're going to be speaking with Pamela Forbus, SVP, Chief Marketing Officer, North America at Pernod Ricard. Pamela, so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining today. Thank you, Matt, for having me. Pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. You've had a fascinating career and <laughs> have worked with some of the most prolific brands in the world. And I'm really excited just to dive in to your journey today. If you think sure. way back to when your career started and you entered the field of marketing, was that something you always thought you wanted to do or did you kind of just stumble into it? Well, um, my, my parents are public school teachers and I uh, had a lot of interests and um, almost went to art school. So my dad's an artist, art teacher, and I thought that's that creative field is where I wanted to go. But I had so many other interests. And one of my friends' dad worked at an ad agency. And so we spent the day there when we were seniors in high school. And I was like, this is it. This is it for me. I, I, I need to be in the space where it, it was just alive. And uh, yeah. I saw the creative and I saw, you know, just business people. And I said, I need to be a place, be here. So I, I made it my mission uh, to get to an ad agency, which I did the day after I graduated. Um, I started in the mailroom. Oh, wow. You actually started in the mailroom. I did. That's hyperbole, but you actually did it. <laughs> it was a requirement. Six weeks in the mailroom. And then traffic, and then it was about, you know, you had to get promoted out of traffic. So that's funny. <laughs> the old, yeah, well, old I, days. I, I know. I have a lot of young employees at, at Suzy, and they're all great, but, you know, they, none of them want to work in the mailroom. They all want to be promoted every six <laughs> weeks, and they probably deserve it, but it's just a different world today in terms of it is. level of expectation. Um, but it's good to know you kind of cut your teeth there. And you, you spent the first 13 years of your career in, in the advertising industry working um, basically on Madison Avenue for Young Rubicam and Shia Day and Campbell Ewald, some of the most prolific ad agencies. What was that experience like, and what were some of the takeaways that you think helped you as you went over to the brand side mm, later in your it's career? It's great. Of course, you know, the agency business is definitely for the young. I'll just say yeah. that. Why is that? Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, it's fast paced. It's really fun. It's, you know, the, the offices are cool. The travel, the production, um, it's, it's, it's hard work. It's overnights because, you know, everything rolls downhill and the, the, any kind of timelines get compressed and you have to figure out how to, how to deliver. Um, I worked, I grew up in Detroit. So, suburbs. And so all of those experiences were uh, Detroit automotive. So I was in automotive. We had big budgets, you know, back then. Yeah. And the, they were the, always at the top of the media spending, right? So, and we were full service agencies, media, creative, you know, experiential. So uh, I, I learned a lot. I think as uh, specifically, I learned how to make great presentations. <laughs> and uh, I was, uh, you know, on the forefront of when before PowerPoint, there was a thing called Adobe Persuasion. And so we were the test to figure out how to build slides in this new software and, and that whole razzle dazzle of, of, you know, wowing your clients and making great presentations and connecting them with storytelling, but also visualizing uh, what you're trying to accomplish. So yeah. um, I think I, that skill was really honed. I, and when I was at Shai Day is when I learned about account planning and I, again, fell in love again. And I wanted to be an account planner. I wanted to be on the strategy side. I was doing account service at the time. So it was a hard transition when you're already pretty senior in account service to make a transition over to account planning and not yeah. take a step back. So it just didn't really happen for me. Um, so I started thinking about, well, I don't know if I'm the ad business is, is in it for me for the long haul. And I, I took about almost a year off and my husband was transferred. He was in the agency business too, to open an office in Dallas for General Motors. And um, I took some time and I said, I think I might want to try this research firm strategy, you know, so I went to work for a couple of small research firms. And that's where I started to kind of get experience, went back to school a little bit, got, you know, some new learning. And then I took a contract position at Frito-Lay, which was like a mile from my house. And I was a contractor just working on a couple of projects. And within a couple of months, they offered me a full-time position, but I took a huge step back huge cut in salary to like start my career over but i it was the best decision i made well do you was, remember do you remember grappling with that decision pam like saying is this really right for me because a lot of people they do think short term in terms of oh i'm taking a paycheck back what should i really do that and you have bills and or is that an easy yeah. decision at the time well uh, so we we 
my husband's pretty smart, I'll have to say. He, he's like, when we move to Dallas, let's figure out how to do it on one salary. So we just adjusted to that. I took some time off. And then anything I brought in was extra. So gotcha. I'm like, all gravy. Uh, and I did have another offer at a research firm to be like head of sales and grow, you know, growth. And my husband's like, no, 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 no. You go to that free lay job and you're, you know, you, you got to do it. So I said, okay. I took the ego hit, right, of the title and all of that, right. and and um, but I was there to learn, and I, I'm a voracious learner. You can see the books in the background here. I'm always um, trying to stay up to date on what the latest thinking is in business books, and um, so I felt it was a great opportunity for me to learn. And what was interesting, within seven years, I was VP of the whole department, and that happened because you know the. Two or oh, three in, years. Insights and analytics department. Yes. So yeah. two or three years, two or three years, I'm learning the fun functional expertise, but I already knew how to give great presentations. I knew how to great, great decks and storytelling. So those two, once I finally brought them together, I sort of stood out uh, among my peers, I think. And, and um, I, I just loved being sort of that right hand to the CMO. I call myself the CMO whisperer. <laughs> Well, I think and, most people who sit on top of insights and analytics should be the CMO whisperer. And if yes. you think about it, you know, you talk about storytelling and what you learned in your early days in Madison Avenue. And ultimately, the output of insights and analytics is stories, right? It it's is. not just graphs. It's not numbers. It's a story that people can believe it's backed by data that gives people conviction to yes. make a decision to, to move the business forward or in a different direction. Yeah. And I, I learned some things from the account planners. You know, they were really good at talking about why the consumer, the person was going to really be, you know, uh, moved by this piece of creative. And so I worked really hard to always humanize data. I love data. I actually have a minor in computer science and me just too. because I loved it and um, math came easy to me. So that blending of art and science or left brain, right brain yeah. um, was, you know, really innate in me. And so humanizing the data storytelling also uh, was uh, something I learned by, from some of those account planners. Yeah, and, and you joined PepsiCo in the year 2000, which was really the dawn of the internet. Um, mm -hmm. I tell my kids the same thing. I started my career when the internet was starting and they look at me like a dinosaur, but the reality is the internet itself is not even that old and no. perspective with history. It's, you know, people who are born with it, I think don't really realize it. Um, no. <laughs> but, right, but the world changed so much over the 17 year career that you had at, at Pepsi um, because, you know, you had very early in the 2000s, the advent of social media and YouTube and, you know, fast forward to where we are today and it's a whole different world. Yeah. How did all those advancements in technology change your role as overseeing the insights and analytics function at, at Frito-Lay? Sure. You, well, you can imagine there were the d early days of mall intercept research. And yeah. Phone call. I remember the research. focus groups at the malls. Yeah. Yeah. Or the phone would ring. Can you take a survey? And, you know, yeah. moving to an online survey was like, <gasps> there were old school people who were just like really afraid yeah. of that. Like, so um, the, the discipline changed a lot. But I think where the career changed a lot is post the 08 crisis. Right. And what So I had, I took, I took the leadership role of the function in 07 and then 08 hit. And all of a sudden, we were being asked different questions. It wasn't just about the consumer or, you know, the brand marketing. It was what's going on with our business. Is it going to slow down? Is it slowing down? Is, is this a consumer problem? Is it a, you know, demand issue? So that crisis, because, you know, we had taken quite a bit of pricing in the 08 crisis and when you come out of that in 09 and 10, the business slows down because you can't take more pricing. Demand right. was returning back to normal, kind of like the COVID situation. Right, right. Sounds familiar, huge right? Demand, huge demand splurge and then a back to normal. When you're back to normal, the business leaders freak out. Is, you know, is snacks, you know, are people snacking less? Are we going right. to, you know, is this, you know, is it because of health and wellness? Well, what we learned was, when we tore apart the business and I became more into business analytics, then we did a lot of it to ourselves, the pricing actions and other things we did kind of slowed the business. And we proved that there is a lot of consumer demand still, which clearly in hindsight, you can say, yeah, you're right. There was a lot of demand. So we, in, I'm going to say invented, we kind of co-created and, and leveraged uh, BCG a lot too, to 
really understand consumer demand. What what are the choice drivers of each of our type, uh, our products and brands? And do we really understand the drivers of choice? And it was a different type of research and it wasn't just sure. research. It was a cons- full on consulting project. Like we changed the entire company, uh, including our, our, our manufacturing outlook. So for, I'll just give you an example. That was the, the biggest one was through this demand work. We, and four sites of where the, uh, consumers were going, um, population migration. We said there's going to be a huge increase of small bags, multi packs, as well as you know convenience stores, dollar stores, um, small bag desire, not just the big party bags. Right. Well, we we didn't have enough manufacturing capacity for the demand we were predicting, and um, so through that work, we were able to get more cap capital expense uh, budget and build more lines and dr- drive more um, s- more capacity for a small bag. So that's just one example how it starts as a little re- consumer research, but it impacts, you know, every yeah, part of the organization. Yeah, it also impacts your, your retail footprint, your merchandising, probably right. promotions, pricing, go to market. So I think when, you t- when, when people talk about consumer centricity and putting the customer at the center, uh-huh. it's not just about having them give you feedback on a social media post. It's what you're yeah. saying, which is core structural feedback, which changed the trajectory at like a tectonic level of your business. Absolutely. I always say, like, con- I am a consumer data advocate. I call myself the money ball marketer, right? Like, that is consumer centricity. The, the, all that data is consumer data. And if you listen to the data and you follow those, those data trails, you're, you're, you can see where it's going. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's very, humans are very predictable. <laughs> I agree. And it's funny, like we, I, I talk often of the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. And I think a lot of companies <laughs> are plagued by that, right? That like yes. they'll have a presentation. Everyone's looking to the person at the head of the table who's often somebody who's disconnected from the core consumer sitting in ivory tower, make decisions. And those are the companies that get blindsided by the disruptors. Yeah. But as long as you have your finger on the pulse of the consumer and you know what they're thinking and feeling and you're, and you're agile and active, well, then you can kind of future proof your business. It, it was an incredible journey post the 08 crisis, and it totally changed my entire way of approaching how to do consumer understanding. And, and we had a lot of success. And my CMO, who is my boss today, so uh, Anne McCurgy was the CMO at, at Frito-Lay. Oh, wow. Uh, she, she got promoted to a global role at PepsiCo and brought me along. And I, we did this across 30 countries um, for snacks and beverages. And um, it was a great w- ride. And it really um, left an impact. And now we're back together. So she went cool. on. The band is back together. Yes, she went on. I went on. And then we got back together and we're, we're we're doing the same sort of playbook um, approach, not the same exact playbook, but the same approach to demand uh, centric uh, understanding. So let's dive into that. So you joined uh, Pernod Ricard um, in the year 2020. So that was an interesting year, obviously, to join a, a company that spells, uh, sells alcoholic beverages. Yes. Um, some ways, a, a boom time, right? I remember doing a lot of research during that period on the space. And obviously, the uh, on-premise business went to zero because no one was going to bars and nightclubs. But then you had so many more people drinking and making drinks at home. And, you know, Drizzly was a big, you know, delivery service that popped up that Uber would en- eventually acquire. I am Imagine that was a really wild time to join Pernod Ricard in 2020 as CMO. Talk to us about that journey. Yeah, it was. It, uh, I joined in June uh, 2020, so it was smack in the in COVID. Yeah. And um, I, the first year I was at home, right, trying to lead a new organization. And my boss said, white sheet it, revamp the entire marketing uh, approach and, and organization. And what do you think we should do? So I... I you know, from reorganizing the team, bringing in new talent, um, laying all the foundational work on the demand uh, data uh, took some time. The COVID was definitely um, had, had, a, had many gifts for us in that time. The, the fact that we shut down a lot of experiential and on-premise means we were able to take that money. Some put it in the bottom line, but we took that money and reinvested in media. And so we had to have better campaigns, better. What gave you the conviction um, to do that? Like, why did you think that was going to pay off? A uh, little bit of that might be a uh, secret sauce, but we had okay, data. Fair enough. We had, we, had, <laughs> we had data that said that, and, and we 
when we do this demand data, we also do what's called path to purchase understanding. So we know the touch points that matter for consumption, right. whether it's on premise or off. And we were convinced many people make decisions before they get to the restaurant, before they get to the store. Sure. It's highly planned, right? If it's highly planned, media is going to work. You're going to stimulate demand. And uh, the whole idea then is to make sure you're there when, when, when they're looking for you and you got to convert. So um, we, we increased our media spend, which means our marketing and our creative had to be more effective and not, you know, not sort of this nice marketing stuff to do, but actually really right. effective. So we put a lot of rigor into how we created our campaigns and a lot of testing. We probably overinvest in consumer feedback, but um, we're, and now we I don't do, think that, you know, I don't think as somebody who runs a market research software company, I don't think there is such a thing <laughs> in over investing. It's a really <laughs> Well, yeah. So I, you know, I won't talk about the past, but um, there was a, there's a lot of data gaps in, I'd, I'd say in the alcohol industry, even yeah. you don't have the robust party, data. You don't have first party data. Like you don't have first party. Right? You don't like, you don't have data from bars and restaurants. You don't have, um, even uh, even some states, because it's state by state, they're not in the Nielsen data set. So you've got a lot of blind spots, and that's really frustrating to someone who loves data. So yeah. um, we we look for ways to create our own data sets, and uh, we did that. And so that that took a quite a bit big investment. Um, we have over sixty thousand consumer interviews. Uh, uh, over the couple of years during like in depth interviews during, that you're doing with consumers, the during the COVID, post COVID, so we know what shifted, what changed, um, and consumers were they were stocking a bar in their home for the first time. Yeah, and, and some of those purchases are probably still sitting there. So there was a big surge in demand, right? And now it's about getting them to consume so they can replenish that that yeah. bar. But um, we did have a, a quite a tailwind, and I think uh, you know thousands of new households buying our brands for the first time, probably. And so it was a great opportunity in that regard. And um, now that on-premise is back, experiential is back, we're just trying to reinvest in that smartly. So we um, right-size those investments as we grow. But um, it's, been a, it's been a great, it was very challenging though to, to inspire a team and do all this change all through you know, Zoom. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, it was definitely a, a, a case study in leadership and change management and all those things. Oh. So it, it's not lost on me, Pam, that also, you know, you joined the CMO seat from really having a background in insights and analytics. Most people take the brand manager path uh, to yeah. get there. I happen to believe that your path is the one that sets one up for success the best because I do believe a lot of this is driven by data. A lot of it's a math equation, et cetera, you know. How, how do you look at the CMO job maybe differently given your background? Because I can yeah. tell you already just by talking to you, you're not bringing up creative and you also oversee <laughs> 240 brands. So you almost yeah. have to have a, you know, a, a very wide lens in how you look at things. Um, yeah. It's not just coming up with a big idea because you have such a wide span of, of remit in terms of going to market. Yeah. So, you know, a, a couple of things. I have, brand VPs who are, you know, doing brand marketing and are yeah. in the weeds, right? Doing that. Oh, so sure. what's, you're asking, what's the role of a CMO? Yeah. Well, creativity is in my blood and I love creativity and I fight to make sure our creative is working. My remit is so much bigger. I, I think of myself as the integrator, whether I'm integrating cross-functional teams uh, to, to get behind the new growth strategy, it's almost kind of almost changed the business model, or I'm integrating data and analytics to, to set a strategy and inspire the organization. So I think um, data can get a little bit uh, telling you what a lot, but it doesn't necessarily get into the why. Sure. And you, you think about performance marketing versus it, brand marketing. So performance marketing is very much about the data and what, math equation. And what, right. what works and you just do more of that and you get more and you do more of that and you get more and you, someone says, well, why is that? And they can't answer the why. Right, right. That, that's really, it's really frustrating because if you knew the why, you might, you, you'd actually might see new opportunities, right? And things that you're not solving for the consumer. So the what, integrating the what and the why is a, an important part of the job. And then again, it's all about leading an organization to, to capture the, the growth. 
So, you know, my priorities right now is, is really, we've got the foundation, we've got the strategy, we've got the data in place. How do we operationalize it to make sure every pocket of demand is, is captured? And so we're, we're working state by state level, creating some really unique um, data sets to help our sales and distributors know when you walk into this account, here's the portfolio we should be selling, which might be different than the account, you know, down the street even. So how do you see demand at a store level and make sure you have the assortment? So when I'm stimulating demand with, with all this marketing that we've invested in, the, the shopper isn't frustrated when they when they get there and they can find what they're looking for. So we're spending a lot of time on that right now, which I don't know if that's a CMO's role or um, I mean, we're looking at media impressions at a state and city level to make sure, you know, we where we are stimulating demand, where we have the um, stock. Right. Another big part of the CMO role I know is about innovation. And, you know, mm -hmm. you talk about listening to consumers in all these interviews, and I know that probably also uncovers new ideas um, for, for new product lines, et cetera. One of which I know Perno Ricard has been investing heavily in is ready to drink cocktails. Yes. Which, when I first heard about that, I was a little surprised just because I look at Perno Ricard as a spirits company, and, you know, it's not really, they're usually an ingredient versus the finished product for consumers. Right. And this is a big leap. You know, what did you, what were you hearing from consumers that led you to this yeah. decision? And how does go to market with a whole new product line look different than your core business? Yeah. It's a great question. I think it was the number one white space we saw, or I would say underserved demand when we yeah. did our de first demand work. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different moments of consumption and some of those moments require extreme convenience. I come downstairs at the end of a hard day on Zoom. What am I going to do? I want to have a cocktail. I'm just too tired. I'll just open a bottle of wine. It's right. way more convenient. Way or more convenient. Beer. Right. Or a beer. Right. So if, if um, I, what I really wanted, though, was maybe an, a nice gin or vodka cocktail. But I, I just don't have the energy right now. And I actually don't even ha think I have the expertise. Because every time I try it, it never tastes as good as that bartender that makes it at that my favorite restaurant, right? So if you can make it ready to serve in a multi-serve bottle or ready to drink in a can, so much easier. Of course, the typical um, convenience moments might be on the go or at a, you know, at a barbecue cookout but there's a lot there's convenience in every demand moment um yeah. and some uh, some are you know even take a look at b2b side the the restaurant and bar uh bars are really hurting for labor a lot of the great bartenders went off and did something else and didn't come back and so it's the majority of open open jobs right now is 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 hospitality in yes US. so how, how do you make cocktails more convenient for i'd say lesser skilled employees right so we're, we're solving for that so it, it again it's it, it convenience it was table stakes in in snacks and beverages when you know where i worked but it was so unserved undeveloped and we we, we got to the table as fast as we could but there were people who beat us to, to that right sure. too so we're we're trying to play catch up but we were also um launching uh, we we stood up a whole innovation hub to go after that space uh, immediately because it's a completely different way of doing business i would imagine completely. right and, and your uh, and your retail footprint is different as well retail footprints different um think of the whole supply chain uh, many of these products have end dates or right. expiration dates or best buy dates you can you can have a bottle of vodka on your you know, in your freezer for years and it doesn't yeah. expire. So um, it, that that making sure we're servicing those retail accounts as fa as often as we needed to, it's all it's it's causing a lot of change. <laughs> so uh, absolutely. So and uh, how involved are you? You mentioned you have brand managers that oversee the 240 brands that um, Pernod Ricard has in their portfolio. How involved are you in creative um, in, in, the, in the actual messaging versus just the medium and the data behind it? And what have you found to be the most effective creative strategies at, at yeah. building your variety of brands? So let me step back. We, Pernod Ricard globally has 240 brands. We've oh. got, um, I don't know, 80, 90, 100 in the U.S. Still um, a lot. <laughs> about, it's still a lot. Once and you pass 10, it just becomes <laughs> a whole different ballgame. Well, and, and we were... 
some of those are, you know, we just deliver and distribute and some of those we do marketing again. So I, I work, I'd Got say it. on about 26, 28 brands. Now we just acquired a few. So uh -huh. 28 brands have full media and team uh, and creative and teams behind them. Some of these brands are U S only. So we have American whiskeys like Jefferson's and we, you know, we own everything from strategy and the website to, um, uh, you know, all the creative and content. Then we have global brands like Absolute out of Sweden or Jameson out of Ireland, uh, Chivas Brothers, you know. Is, uh, so we we are the U.S. marketing arm of those global imports. Now, before we came, a lot of, before Ann and I joined the company, I'd say, um, a lot of that process was the global brands creating a lot of global content that the U.S. would run. Right. Uh, when I joined, the company had decided to flip that and they are putting creative content directors in the U.S. to create bespoke U.S. creative because we needed to be more um, relevant and authentic to the U.S. consumer. Now, if some of those can be global co uh, content, great, but most often we have a global big idea with bespoke U.S. creative. So we're very involved. We're very involved with all the agencies briefing them and then you know the we create thousands of pieces of content around a campaign it's not I just imagine. you know yeah. uh, you've got we do platform specific because what works in pinterest doesn't necessarily work in instagram doesn't necessarily work on youtube so we are now we have um very big spreadsheets of hub hygiene you know and hero content that we create and we work very closely with those brand companies on the hero content and then we have an full in-house studio, as well as, uh, I call them tier two agencies that help us get all of the rest of it Production, done. Production, right. Yes. So um, yep. there's about uh, 200 people in the marketing department. If you count field marketing, commercial marketing, shopper marketing, brand marketing, then I have a marketing accelerator team that has media, the content studio, all the data and ad tech, martech. That's all in one center of excellence because it's so uh, interrelated. We do a lot of dynamic content with our DCO. So it gets pretty advanced. Um, all of that was stood up again, uh, post COVID or during COVID. And um, uh, once it's great now, it's fully operating. I call it our mar modern marketing machine uh, is, is up and going. Yeah, yeah, totally makes sense. And it sounds like a massive operation. Um, one thing I'm sure you have your eye on is just obviously, uh, I know you're a student of the consumer and consumer trends. And, you know, the Gen, Gen Z is, is getting older. The oldest uh, Gen Z consumers are 24 years old. So they're well into the legal drinking age of alcohol. And Gen Z, you know, has been proven to drink less alcohol than older generations. Mm -hmm. um, so that obviously creates headwinds um, for your business moving forward and just makes it harder for you to compete um, and, and drive growth. How are you thinking about Gen Z, especially obviously this cannabis legalization in so many states across the country, which I'm sure is something to do with it. So how are you looking at addressing that moving forward? It's true. I think, you know, when we were young, we, what did we start with beer? And yeah. then, you know, <clears throat> I don't know that they are. They're starting with seltzers or right. um, so, so we believe these RTDs and <clears throat> They are lower alcohol content and they are a nice entry point into spirits as well. Um, and so we're, we're following the trends very closely. Pernod Ricard has bought uh, some no alcohol brands recently globally. And uh, Which we is a do a big trend with that. Generation. We, yep, that's yeah. right. So so that's um, that's definitely on our radar and in, in the pipeline. Um, but it then, you know, beyond that, just really understanding what Gen Z is thinking about. Um, 21, we say 21 plus, right? Um, these are these are a bit more activist consumers, I, I'd call them. I happen to have a, a child who's a Gen Zer, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> they 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 are not shy about sharing their opinions about companies and brands, and yep. and they are, you know, I remember launching the compostable bag of sun chips back in the day. And I just don't think the consumer was ready for, you know, uh, what was required because it, 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 when you make choices to, to, to dry, to, to buy these sustainable brands, sometimes you have to make compromises for sun chips. The c compromise was the bag was very loud. You can Google it. Right. Sometimes <laughs> said, it's taste, sometimes it's cost. 
That's right. Cost, taste, right. or some something in the experience is compromised, and consumers just weren't willing to pay more or to right. compromise. So, um, but that's not true with Gen Z. They are they are looking, they're watching, they're holding companies accountable, they're calling them out. So we, you know, we work really hard to to just stand in our values, be authentic. Um, it, whether it's absolute with the LGBTQ community. Um, you know, our um, American whiskeys, we're, we're, we're building a, a highly sustainable, probably the most sustainable distillery in the world will be in one of our distilleries that we're, we're committed to spending $250 million over the next five years. So if you think about it, we sell wine, champagne, and grain alcohols. We are an agricultural company. So yeah. per, per no very much the, the terroir, the, the sustainability, the uh, environmental sustainability is very important to Pernod. And so that will ring true to um, the Gen Z as well, I think. Sure. Absolutely. So shifting gears as we kind of wrap up here and looking to the future, what are some other trends that you have your eye on in terms of the consumer related to the category or even, you know, the, the media world at large? that you know you're really interested in and think may cause you to kind of maybe rethink things as, as you've clearly done so many times in your career to date in terms of making the right pivots yeah um again uh, following the data following the insights i think the shopping experience for spirits is really painful in many cases yeah um it the the store experience whether you're going to that liquor store on the corner or, you know, try, every state's a little different. Sometimes you can buy it in the grocery store, but the selection's just not what you wanted. And so you're having to make multiple trips, like just really thinking through how to um, improve that experience, the omni-channel experience. So we're working really hard to think about how consumers use digital content during their shopping experience to just ease that path, whether they're looking for a gift or, um, looking for you know where to buy so spending a lot of time on that also just working with our retail partners to just you know right. consult and say you know here's here's let's try some new things so that's one of them um we are you already talked about convenience it's going to be here and, and be a trend for here to, to come so we've got lots of ideas in in the hopper for that um look for some really new exciting offers from absolute this summer um and um let me think i think those are the big ones you know what keeps me up at night though is is just this fight for attention it's just yeah. so hard harder than to, ever right harder than ever and so the the stakes are higher uh you you know cons you know we're thinking a lot about um different ways to create content to capture attention it's not just the you know 15 second ad anymore or a digital banner like we really need to to get inventive there so um maybe even and you you saw the headlines a lot of agencies are investing in entertainment or content um and i think instead of just product placement you might see it's kind of back to the old soap opera days right <laughs> where um the the brands were creating real content that consumers want to watch so yeah i think that could be an area of the future Absolutely. Absolutely. Those are all big areas for, for any brand right now. Matt, you notice I didn't say AI. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah. So, well, so let's, let's get into that. Why didn't you say AI? I'm glad it's you good question. that out. <laughs> um, I think AI is going to be an incredible tool um, and it, it will help us do break the, the paradigms of what we think is possible so yeah. i in, in the future i believe we're going to have a concept a big idea but then let's have ai take it way farther you know just really break right. some paradigms so when i that that fight for attention i think um ai is going to really help us like so what's, break what's our, the butt well it's a tool and tools can be misused any tool yeah. can be misused so there's a lot of you know uh, a lot of interest in how do you do it safely and everyone's gonna it'll get tackled it'll happen you know we'll when you train ai on for example a lot of these tools are trained on open data if you train it on your internal data 
it's probably a lot safer, right? Yeah. Um, so the, I can see it being a huge productivity tool for, for humans to get our work done differently and faster. But I also think um, it's going to help us see things that were, that we didn't help us see things that we don't normally see on our own and just really stretch our imagination. It's like, it's like an added create creative person in the room yeah. with your creative partners. So yeah, it'll be, it's fascinating to see how quickly this is all unfolding, yeah. and, you know, where it's going to Im really impact the consumer and impact brands. So, um, so to wrap up here, I mean, yeah, I was just saying earlier, you've had a great career. You've worked for so many great brands have, mm -hmm. have really had such a deep rooted experience and understanding the consumer. As you look back on your career, what are some of the decisions that you think you made, right? Obviously you talked about taking the, the, the kind of half a step backwards when you first joined Frito-Lay right. and if, if you hadn't, who knows where you'd be today? you yeah. probably wouldn't be on the speed of culture podcast today. <laughs> you would. Um, what were some of the things you think you did right throughout your career that maybe you'd wish to impart on some of our younger listeners? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, I, a career progression. And when you think about career progression, you're thinking about promotions, right? Rising through mm -hmm. the ranks. Um, there's a point, and I'm going to say maybe around the director level where it's not about your functional skills. It's about your leadership skills. So I had taking that jump is a big jump. And uh, there were things that I was passed over for some big uh, jobs at a point. And I, my first advice would be one, ask for feedback. People, yeah. everyone has a buzz about it's them. Great everyone one. has, everyone has something that they're not a blind a spot. Blind, Blind spots. That's it. Yep. And I, I, everything from asking for feedback about what you could be doing better. But think about this. Like the, one of the best things I ever did was I was giving a big presentation to a, to a global team. I asked my best friend to watch the audience, see where I was connecting, where I wasn't connecting, where was I losing them? What should I have done or said differently? Give me advice, like brutal feedback. And that per I knew that person was taking notes and I could engage with the audience and I didn't have to like think about it. And it was fantastic. And it, it, it led me to go get a different presentation coach. So that leads me to my second advice is we are professionals, just like a professional athlete. I follow golf. I'm a big golfer and a golf fan. All of those professional golfers have multiple coaches, swing coaches, trainers, nutrition coaches, right? They, they're at the top of their game and they're still getting coaches. So right. why shouldn't we? I've had right. multiple coaches in my career that have completely changed my career trajectory. Whether your company provides it or you ask, you know, or you pay for it yourself, it's, it will pay back. I if you're looking to get these bigger, bigger jumps, you're not gonna be able to do it on your own. And it's not because of your work. You know, what's interesting is that as I think about the younger consumer, I know you mentioned you have a, you know, a, a Gen Z child and I, I have two, so I, I totally get it, is that in this social media era, there's such a pressure to be successful. And there's also pressure for kids to like get straight A's. And I don't know if straight A's is ultimately the goal because you, you're amazing at data analytics. It doesn't mean that you had to be great at history, right? Because that you being great at that one right. thing propelled your career. And it's better to be amazing at one thing that's sort of like a jack of all trades, master of none, right? And yeah. I think ultimately because of that, I believe younger people are just scared to hear their blind spots because they feel like they have to be great at mm -hmm. everything and nobody yeah. really is. It, it, it's the fixed versus growth mindset. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. People will follow that advice for sure. Yeah. Interesting. I think that just last comment on that, the, the, Please. the fight, fight, fight for perfection and grades, at least when, you know, we were in school, it, it was all about getting to the best colleges. Right. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm thinking that is going to get disrupted. It already has. Um, sure. There's enough evidence now that some of the best people come from very small schools. <laughs> you don't have to get into that big. I didn't go to a big school. You can look at it up on LinkedIn. I went to a small state college and, um, but I, I'm a continuous learner. I'm, it's, yeah. I did it rest. So, and I'm very connected in the academia world. I've served on boards for Marketing Science Institute and I know all the yeah. top professors. Yeah. So I, I, and I can, you know, I was intimidated in my younger years, but now I think I could have a nice conversation with, any marketing professor and on any, on any marketing topic, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, I think what's changing that is that 
the access to information and education exactly. is, 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 you know, it, it's everywhere. So you don't need to be inside a prestigious school to learn from the best professors in the world. You That's know, right. and, and, and you also access to people is so much more now than it used to be. You can yep. get in front of almost anybody if you have good content, if you have something to say, where in the past, unless you went to University of Pennsylvania, you couldn't really connect with people at University of Pennsylvania. You didn't even know who they were. So I think the world right. has changed a lot. It and I has. think Yeah, and I think it, it is sending people down the wrong path, maybe to learn the wrong things. And, and the other big part of it is college is more expensive than ever before. It's grown at such a greater rate it's than inflation. Crazy. Kids go to college and then when they leave, they can't pursue their passion because they have to pay down their student loans. That's right. Right. So yeah, it actually it's... sends them to do maybe things they're not good at. So I think the, the the higher education industrial complex definitely needs to change. Yep. And it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Absolutely. Well, this has been an amazing discussion. Finally, I mean, is there a quote or mantra you like to live by? Oh. I imagine it might be something around data, but maybe there's another no. side to you that we haven't discussed yet. <laughs> um it's 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 on my LinkedIn. So my motto is um, um, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. Yeah, I love that. So it, it and it's not because I live at the edge of my comfort zone. It's to remind me to st keep pushing to my yeah. outside my comfort zone. That's where I learn. That's where new opportunities come to me. It's you know, I. I know I'm not really a huge risk taker. I'm very contemplative. I need to have the facts. But um, once I have those facts, I'm not, I'm fearless in going forward to, you know, where I want to go. So, um, it's, it's important, even at this point in my career, like, you know, I, I have all these ideas that you, you don't necessarily want to verbalize because you're afraid that what if that, yeah. you know, what if that doesn't come true? You know, someone says you should write a book. I'm like, Ugh, I get stomach aches, but there I am. <laughs> I'm on the edge of my comfort zone. That's telling right. me something that's telling me that's probably where life is going to happen. <laughs> Right, right. Well, I, I really hope it does. I'll definitely be reading it. So, uh, thank you so much. It's been a great discussion. I feel like it could go on forever. So looking <laughs> forward to uh, keeping things moving and seeing what you're able to accomplish at Printer Ricard. So on behalf of Susie and the Adweek team, thanks again to Pamela Forbus, SVP, Chief Marketing Officer at Pernod Ricard. For joining us today, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and ACAST Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.